All right, so here is the setup. A ball is thrown straight up from the top of a 160 foot building. So I'm just gonna draw a picture instead of actually writing all the words. So we're at the top of a building, it's 160 feet tall. And we're throwing the ball up, but it's gonna hit some max or high and then it's gonna fall back down to the ground. And the initial velocity, which we usually write as v naught, is going to be, we're throwing it upwards with an initial velocity of 48 feet per second. It's also worth noting that the initial height, h naught, is 160 feet. Because typically, unless there's some reason not to, we're usually imagining the ground as height equal to zero. And if you go up, that's a positive height. If you go down, like if you're digging in the dirt, that's a negative height. Um, sometimes it makes sense to do a different frame of reference, um, but usually if there's nothing else to be thought about, the ground is zero. Sometimes I will say, no, 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 that's not, 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 I would say a thing, but it's not really something that comes from this class, so I won't say it. Um, so the first question actually is, what is the average velocity from t equals two seconds to t equals four seconds? So, right. Two seconds is maybe, I don't know. I actually know where the ball is after two seconds. So what is the average velocity from t equals two to t equals four? Well, to answer that question, we actually need to know the position equation, right? So when you're trying to find average velocity, the average velocity is going to be the change in height over the change in time, right? Change in position or displacement divided by the change in time. So that's going to be the height at time equal to four seconds minus the height at time equal to two seconds divided by two seconds. Um, we don't have the height equation. Did they give it to us? I mean, it's okay if they didn't. Um, they did not give us the height equation. So usually, it's kind of assumed that we know what the height equation is. So we can always find the height equation. The height equation, assuming you're just talking about kinematics, right? Throwing a ball up or down. The height at time t is always going to be um, h naught plus v naught times t minus 16 t squared. If you're talking about feet per second, or sorry, feet. That's the height, the time t for a ball thrown upwards. Um, so in this case, it's going to be 160 plus 48 times t minus 16 t squared. The minus 16 t squared is because of gravity, right? Gravity is negative 32 feet per second. And then if you differentiated this, you would get negative 32 times t. Um, so let's see, what do we get here? We're going to get h of 4. So I'm just going to plug in 4 and get 160 plus 48 times 4 minus 16 times 4 squared is 16 minus, then I'm going to plug in 2 and we get 160 plus 48 times 2, which is 96, minus 16 times 2 squared, which is 16 times 4, which is 64, divided by 2. Let's see, the 160s cancel. 48 times 4 is 192. And 192 minus 16 squared is 256. Minus 96 plus 64 all over 2. This ends up being something. I suppose I could use a calculator. Well, this thing's going to be negative. That's interesting. So let's see. Calculator tab. Um, let's see. 192 minus 256 minus 96 plus 64 because the minus sign distributed ends up being negative 96 and then we divide that by two, it's gonna be negative 48. That's gonna be negative 48 feet per second. Okay. What else do we want to answer? Let's see. We also want to know what's the instantaneous velocity at both of those times. So what is the velocity at time two and the velocity at time four. Well, to find the velocity, the instantaneous velocity, we need the velocity equation. And I just erase the height equation. 
Mm, yeah, I'll go with this one. We'll come back. So, right, the height equation at time t again was 160 plus 48t minus 16t squared. The velocity is the derivative of height or position. This is going to be 48 minus 30t. So the velocity after two seconds, or I should say at two seconds, right? Velocity at exactly two seconds after you've thrown it is going to be 48 minus 32 times two. 48 minus 64 is negative 16 feet per second. So already at two seconds, we have gone past the apex where velocity is equal to zero and we are traveling downwards. And maybe t equals two seconds is right here and the velocity is negative 16 feet per second. And then when we get to t equals four seconds, right? it's gonna be going even faster in the downward direction. So we are expecting at four seconds to get an even more negative velocity. Let's see. V of four is going to be 48 minus 32 times four, which is going to be, uh, let's see, 48 minus 128, so negative 80 feet per second. Okay. What else can we ask about this? Um, the typical, so aside from asking questions about like velocity, average velocity over an interval or velocity at a certain moment, the typical questions for a ball thrown are the following two. How high does it go? And how fast is it when it hits the ground? Those are the two standard questions. Like if someone says, I throw a ball in the air, usually you can be like, okay, they're gonna ask me how high did the ball go? And how fast was it going when it hit the ground? So to answer the how high question, there are actually two things we need to find. First, we need to find what time it was when it was at its maximum height. I think one of these green pens don't suck. All these green pens look like they suck. Try this one. It's almost like the least sucky. So to find how high, we need to first find when. Well, the ball reaches a maximum height when the velocity is zero. Right, the velocity is positive if it goes up, zero at the top, and then negative if it goes down. Another way to think about this, which you should be thinking about, is you're setting the derivative of height equal to zero to find when it has a maximum. This is going to be a common theme when we start graphing things. If you want to find where a function has a maximum or a minimum, you take its derivative and you set it equal to zero. So I'm trying to find where height has a maximum. I'm going to take the derivative of height which was velocity, which we said was 48 minus 32 T. And set that equal to zero. And yeah, I think this, this green pen might be trash. All my green pens are trash. I have a red pen. How about a good red pen? Yeah, all right, cool. So say that equal to zero, I'm gonna solve for T. So 48 equals 32 T. T is 48 divided by 32, which reduces to three halves. Or to prefer decimals, 1.5. So after 1.5 seconds, we've reached the maximum height. That doesn't tell me how high it is, it just tells me when I am at the highest point. To find out how high it is, we're going to put that back into the height equation. So here's my height equation, and I'm going to say that height at three halves of a second is going to be 160 plus 48 times 3 over 2 minus 16 times 3 over 2 squared. 3 over 2 squared is 9 over 4. I think this is much easier. Like, if you actually have to do this by hand, it's much easier to write them as fractions than it is as decimals. Because like 1.5 squared is a decimal. It's just, I mean, you can do it, but it's hard, I think. This is going to be 160. 48 divided by 2 is 24. 24 times 3 is 72. And then 16 divided by 4 is 4, and then 4 times 9 is 36. So I end up with 160 plus 72 minus 36. That's going to be 196 feet high. So that's how we find the maximum height. We find when the velocity is zero, and then we take that time and we plug it into the height equation. 
finding how fast it's going when it hits the ground is kind of the opposite. So how fast when we hit the ground? Well, first of all, when we hit the ground, the ball is going downwards, meaning the velocity is going to be negative when we hit the ground. Just something to be aware of. So to find how fast it is when it hits the ground, we have to find out when it hits the ground, which is when the height is zero, and then plug that into the velocity to figure out how fast it's going. So we're gonna set the height equal to zero. So I'm gonna take my height equation, and if someone was nice, they've made it so 16 is gonna factor out. It is gonna factor out. So we're gonna set 160 plus 48t minus 16t squared equal to zero. I might just divide both sides by negative 16, and I would say negative so I can get a positive t squared. So we divide everything by negative 16. I'm gonna get negative 10 minus 3t plus t squared equal to zero. I'm gonna write that as t squared minus 3t minus 10 equal to zero. And if they were extra nice, they will make it so it factors. And it does factor. This factors as t minus five times t plus two equal to zero. So the ball hits the ground at t equal to five seconds. You could also say it hits the ground at t equal to negative two seconds. That seems kind of weird. But if you think about it, that negative two actually doesn't make, isn't total garbage. It just means that, right, so here's time equals zero when you threw the ball. And if you could go backwards in time two seconds and pretend that you threw it from the ground, right, it would have taken two seconds to get from the ground to a height of 160 feet. It's not totally meaningless, but I mean, yeah. So then, right, it goes up to 1.5, and then down here, time equal to five seconds is when it hits the ground. So then, to find out how fast the ball is going when it hits the ground, we plug that into the velocity equation. So the, the velocity at five seconds is going to be 48 minus 32 times five. Uh, 32 times five is 32 times 10 divided by two. So 320 divided by two is 160. 48 minus 160 is negative 112 feet per second. Those are pretty standard um, velocity and position questions. How high does the ball go? How fast is the ball going when it hits the ground? And those always involve first finding what time it is when that thing happens by either setting the velocity equal to zero if you're trying to figure out how high it goes or the height equal to zero if you're trying to figure out when it hits the ground. And then finding either the velocity if it's hitting the ground or the height if it's how high it is. Questions about any of this velocity position setup? Um, there are a couple other questions I will, I will, I will tack on this. So small point of interest, I would say that the, velo the, the ball hits the ground with a velocity of negative 112 feet per second. I would say that the ball hits the ground with a speed of 112 feet per second. The speed is always positive, right? We always think of speed as just without direction. We don't care if it's positive or negative. We're just talking about how fast the thing is going, whether it's up, down, left, or right. Whereas velocity also needs to include the direction. So when you talk about velocity of something, you say, oh, if it's going up, it's positive. If it's going down, it's negative. So I say the ball hits the ground with a speed of 112 feet per second. And then the other thing I wanted to ask is actually about the acceleration. So yeah. So the position of the ball, or the height of the ball is 160 plus 48t minus t squared feet at t seconds. And then we found that velocity was, right, 48 minus 32 t feet per second. 
and that's the derivative of position. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity, is the second derivative of position. In this case, acceleration is just negative 32 feet per second per second. Or if you prefer, negative 32 feet per second squared. And so if I said, what's the acceleration after one second, there's nowhere to plug in the one. The acceleration is just negative 32 feet per second squared, which is always going to be the case for an object that is fought, that, that you've thrown, like it's, it's moving through the air without anything else acting on it, right? If it's just gravity that is pulling the ball down towards the earth, the acceleration is always going to be negative 32 feet per second per second, which just means that every second it's going Ne it's going 32 feet negative. After every second, its downward speed is increasing by 32 feet per second. So I erase a picture, right? If it starts off going right 48 per feet per second up, sorry, if it starts off, oh, words, challenge. Okay, so just to kind of lay this out even further, right? If it starts off going 48 feet per second upwards, then after one second, it's going 16 feet per second because it's slowed down by 32 feet per second. And then after another one second, it's going negative 16 feet per second. And after another one second, it's going negative 48 feet per second. After another second, it's going negative, you know, whatever that's going to be, negative 80 feet per second, and so on and so forth. So that's what, what I mean when I say that, right, the acceleration is negative 32 feet per second per second. Every second, it's going thirty. It's going. It's lost thirty feet per second. Oh, no problem, Gabrielle. Thanks for letting me know. Um, okay. So I think that's a fairly good explanation of what's going on with the velocity stuff. Um, it's probably worth memorizing or remembering that this is the position function. The height is h naught plus v naught times time minus 16 t squared. That's your position in feet where time is measured in seconds. And then velocity is the derivative of that. Acceleration is the second derivative, which is the derivative of velocity. Excuse me. All right, I think I've said enough about that. If I haven't, you guys can let me know. We can do more examples. Well, let's go ahead and do one more marginal kind of example. I feel like, I feel like the examples I did last time were a little canned, a little contrived. I feel like we can do one that takes a little more thought. So let's look at, I had you, where'd you go? Sorry, I was hiding problems for myself. Okay. So, Let's talk about this one. So the demand function for x, this problem says newspapers, no, it's fine, newspapers anymore, but fine. The demand function for x newspapers um, at a newsstand is given by p equal to five minus 0.001x and the cost function is given by c equal to 35 plus 1.5x and we want to know a couple things um firstly what's the revenue function Okay, so revenue, at least in our textbook, revenue is defined to be pro, wow, revenue is, oh, revenue, like, I was, I was already getting the profit. I was going to say the profit, which is what we really want to know, profit is going to be our revenue minus our cost. We need to know revenue first. So revenue is going to be 
So I feel like demand function, I've always never liked this name. Demand just means price, right? So if it, it's, I'm not I'm like, yeah. So now I'm like, let me double check that because I've never loved that terminology. Let me take a look real quick. Yep. Yeah, okay, so yeah, all right. So the problem with the demand function is, yeah. So yes. So P is the price and X is the number of items we're selling. So the reason I don't like it this way is because it always feels like, okay, so you're saying if I sell more, the price is less. That's not really the way it should be interpreted. What we're really saying is that if you decrease the price, you increase the number of newspapers. It's just that it usually is more helpful for us to solve for the price. So we could totally solve for X here if we wanted to. I don't really want to, but I will just, I will just to kind of point out that what we're actually saying here is that if we solve for X, so I'm gonna say 0 0.001 is one one thousandth. I'm gonna add that to the other side. So one one thousandth X plus P equals five and then subtract P. So one one thousandth X equals five minus P. So that X equals 5,000 minus 5,000 P. So that if we, right, if the, sorry, it's always, it's always trouble saying this, right? If we make the price higher, right? So if the, if the P is larger, X is going to be smaller, right? The more, and right, so like here, the price probably needs to be between like zero and a dollar. Right, so if the price was zero, we would sell 5,000 newspapers. The price was 50 cents, 5,000 minus half of 5,000 is 2,500. So I say if you increase the price, you decrease the number that you sell. But then we want to solve for P because we want to know what the price is as a function of how many we're selling instead of the other way around. I always found this a little confusing, not gonna lie. You can probably tell that I found this a little confusing. Um, so anyway, the revenue is not hard to calculate once we know the price. The revenue is just the number that you sell, which is X, times the price you sell them for. So the revenue here, revenue is just going to be X times the demand function, which is going to be X times five minus 0 0.001 X. Great, that's not too terrible. And you can multiply that out. So then the profit is going to be the revenue, which we just calculated, x times five minus 0.001x minus the cost function, which is right there, 35 plus 1.5x. Okay, great. So let's actually simplify this a little bit so that we can then answer, whoops, the actual question you want to answer, which is, um, yeah, we'll work, we'll work there. So, okay, let me, sure. So this is gonna be, what have I got here? I've got five X minus 0 0.001 X squared minus 35 minus 1.5 X. So it looks like I've got 3.5 X. Okay, I can write that, sorry. So I get a little crazy here. So our profit here is going to be 5x minus 0.001x squared minus 35 minus 1.5x. Let's rewrite this in a more sensible way. Let's write this as negative 0.001x squared. Um, 5x minus 1.5x is 3.5x minus 35. So a couple questions we might want to answer. Um, something like, what is the, so typically we got, I, I started reading through the notes and she likes to ask, or Abby would ask questions like, you know, if you were, if we were making like, say, if we were printing 
a hundred newspapers. Does it make sense financially to print more? Meaning, is our marginal profit going to be positive, right? If we're making 100 newspapers and our marginal profit is positive there, then, oh yeah, we should make more because our pro our, right, we're gonna be making more profit if we make more newspapers. Um, so let's find out. So let's find the derivative. The derivative is gonna be negative 0.001 times 2x, so negative 0.002x plus 3.5. And if we plug in 100, P prime of 100 is going to be, let's see, if you multiply something by 100, you move the decimal over two places. That's going to be, let's see, 1, 2, negative 0.2 plus 3.5, which is going to be 3.3. .3. So yeah, right? Yes. We should definitely print more newspapers if we're only making 100. What if we're making a thousand? So if I'm printing a thousand newspapers, my marginal profit, if I print the next newspaper, is going to be, well now 0 0.002 times a thousand is just two. So it's gonna be negative two plus 3.5, which is still 1.5, which is still positive. So even if we're making printing a thousand newspapers, we should still print more because printing more still is going to make us more money than it's going to cost us. But if we do, if we go like say to 2,000, so if we were printing 2,000 newspapers and I want to print the next one, the next one's not going to be worth it. If I print 2,000, I'm going to get negative four, right? 0 0.002 times 2,000 is going to be negative. It's going to be four and it's negative four. Plus 3.5 is going to be negative 0.5. So printing that next newspaper, I'm actually going to lose money on it, right? The marginal profit is negative there. So no, we should not make more newspapers. Another way to think about this is the way you're going to maximize your profit is by taking this profit equation, which is a downward opening parabola, right? There's your profit, right? Very hastily graphed. If you want the profit to be maximized, you want to find the top, meaning you want to find where the derivative is zero. Right? You want to get all of the positive marginal profit where the derivative is positive and then you don't want to get over to the negative part. So if we actually take this derivative and say set it equal to zero, we can solve for x. So um, let's see, sure, 3.5 equals positive 0.002x. So x equals 3.5 divided by 0 0.002. I'm going to write 0 0.002 as two one thousandths. So then x is 3.5 times a thousand divided by two. That's 3,500 over two, that's 1,750. So 1,750 newspapers is the place where we make the most money. And that's definitely something we do a lot of in the future, right? Um, there's a whole section on optimization that we'll get to eventually, where we're going to be trying to find what value makes a function maximal or minimal, depending on what we're trying to figure out. Let me go ahead and do the thing here. All right, so there are some examples of both marginals and velocity stuff. Hopefully you find those useful, helpful. But let's go ahead and talk about the chain rule all the time. All right. Chain rule. So just as a refresher, here are the things we know how to take the derivatives of so far. That's kind of it. So we have the power rule. Right? We know how to find the derivative, which I like to use the symbol for the derivative of x to any power is that power times x to the one less power. We have the product and quotient rules, but those aren't, those aren't really rules for specific functions. Those are just rules in general. But I'll, I'll write them down just because it's good to remind ourselves. So the product rule, if you're taking the derivative 
of f times g. It's the derivative of f times g plus f times the derivative of g. Or as I like to think of it, the derivative of one thing times the not derivative of the other thing plus, and then you do vice versa. You do the not derivative of the first thing times the derivative of the second thing. So it's always one derivative and one not derivative multiplied together, and then you add every way possible. Quotient rule. All right, we have the derivative of, ooh, that's not that one, right? We have the derivative of f divided by g. It is important that if you're thinking about the formula for the quotient rule, that you do write f as the top function and g as the bottom function. And then it's going to be f prime g minus f g prime over g squared. Or as I like to think of it, the bottom function times the derivative of the top minus the top function times the derivative of the bottom, all divided by the bottom squared. And then we have all the trig derivatives. So here's all the trig derivatives. Reminder, the derivative of every cofunction is going to be negative. The derivative of sine is cosine of x. The derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. The derivative of tangent of x is secant squared of x. And then we have the reciprocal functions. The reciprocal of sine is cosecant. The derivative of cosecant of x is negative cosecant x cotangent x. The derivative of the reciprocal of cosine is secant. The derivative of secant x is secant x tangent x. And finally, the reciprocal of tangent is cotangent. The derivative of cotangent x is negative cosecant squared x. You definitely want to memorize these. They come up all the time. All right. Maybe I'll leave that there for a minute. And then finally, we have the chain rule, which most people end up writing the following way, taking the derivative of, say, f of g of x is equal to f prime of, leave the insides alone, times the derivative of the insides. I will often write something like this. The derivative of f of some stuff is equal to f prime of leave the stuff alone times the derivative of the stuff. It's the same thing. I'm just using the word stuff instead of the function g of x. All right, examples. So the examples for the chain rule can get very, very complicated, right? There can be a lot of steps. It can, there can be a lot of bookkeeping to make sure that we are kind of keeping track of everything very carefully. Um, let's look at some examples. I feel like, let me actually, let me grab, there is, I know I have a handout somewhere that I want to take some examples from just because I know they're really good. One moment, one sec, sorry. Where'd you go, favorite examples of mine? Maybe they're hiding somewhere else. There we go. Found them. Awesome. Yes. Um, I might take some of the examples from this, or I might change up, and I might just post this for you guys because I've got answers too. So, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. But yeah, this will, this is good inspiration here. So let's see. Um, yeah, let's do something like this. How about the derivative of one over the cube root of x to the fourth plus tangent x plus sine of x. A lot of differentiating things is knowing that you need to rewrite them before you differentiate them. Could you use the quotient rule here? Definitely. Should you use the quotient rule here? Definitely not. Right? We should definitely rewrite this as the derivative of x to the fourth plus tangent x plus sine of x. To the what power? Well, 
if I've got the Q root, that's the one third power, but since it's in the denominator, it's going to be the negative one third power. That's gonna be a lot easier to deal with than using the chain, the quotient rule. We are gonna use the chain rule. So let's see, so I've got some stuff to the negative one third. The derivative is negative one third times my stuff. to the negative one third minus one. So that's gonna be negative four thirds power. And then we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside part here. This is gonna be four X cubed plus the derivative of tangent is secant squared X plus the derivative of sine X is cosine X. If you be extra careful, I saw a fair number of people on the quiz definitely like put the derivative of this stuff inside here, right? When you're doing the chain rule, you do the outer function derivative and you leave the inside alone. And then you multiply by the derivative inside. So just make sure, right? When you're using the chain rule, the inside stuff should always show up unadulterated before you take its derivative. Okay. I'm just gonna leave the other side alone for a minute here. So we can, read, so we can go back to it if we want to. Um, Person here. Oh, yeah, it's not important. Cool. All right, let's see. What else have I got? All kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah, let's do one like this. I feel like these, so these come up fairly frequently. Let's say I want to find the derivative. Uh, let's write it this way. So I'm, I'm a fan of this notation where I say it's the derivative of the function. But we can write it differently. We could say like maybe our function is y equal to, let's go tangent to the sixth of x cubed minus cotangent x. Uh, let's do x cubed. Sure, let's make it even more fun. x cubed times cosine of x. So this is a, what I always think of as a more special case in that, well, in fact, it's not really. What I'm really trying to say here is that it's always good to think about, should I rewrite this before I take the derivative? And the answer is often yes. Here, we definitely did. Here, you don't, you maybe don't need to, I need to. I need to rewrite this as y equal to tangent of x cubed times cosine of x to the sixth power so that I can recognize that, oh, my outermost function is being raised to the sixth power. And so that when I differentiate this, you can either write your derivative as y prime, you can write it as dy dx, whatever you prefer. I got some stuff to the sixth power and the derivative is six times my stuff to the fifth. So I'm gonna get six, times my stuff to the fifth power. So my stuff is tangent of x cubed times cosine. Okay. So now I have to multiply by the derivative of that stuff. And here's where we're gonna to have to actually use the chain rule twice. Because now I'm gonna multiply by the derivative of tangent of some stuff. So some people like to write this out in like multiple steps. I usually don't, but I will this time. So I'm gonna write, I'm just gonna multiply by the derivative of tangent of x cubed times cosine of x. And then I'm actually going to do it, right? So then I'm going to rewrite it, right? I don't want to do it because it feels like a lot of writing. We have 6 times tangent of x cubed times cosine of x to the fifth power times the derivative of this stuff is going to be, well, the derivative tangent of some new stuff is secant squared of that stuff of that new stuff times the derivative of this new stuff. So now I have to take the derivative of that. And that's going to require the product rule because it's x cubed times cosine. So the derivative of x cubed times cosine is going to be derivative of x cubed times cosine plus x cubed times the derivative of cosine of x, which is negative sine of x. I would probably just put the minus sign there and write it as minus x cubed times sine of x. But if you write it there, make sure you put parentheses around it so it doesn't look like you're saying x cubed minus sine of x, but x cubed times negative sine of x. 
All right. Questions about this one? Um, it's often the case that you're going to have to use like the product of the quotient rule inside of a chain rule or outside of a chain rule, like in the following question. And let's say, yeah, this would be terrible. Let's say I wanted to find the derivative <clears throat> of, oh yeah, this is real, real ugly secant of 4x divided by x cubed plus 1 to the 4th. Uh, let's make it a 5, uh, 7. Mm. Yeah, I'll do a thing. So let's find the derivative. I am going to have to use the, quotient, the chain rule. I'm also going to have to use the quotient rule. And so some people kind of have a hard time deciding what comes first. It can be hard to kind of tell. So, but here kind of the quotient rule comes first. I don't know how to say that other than I see something divided by something else. And that's kind of the first thing I'm encountering, right? It's not some power of some fraction or some square root of some fraction, right? The fraction is kind of the first thing we are seeing. So we take the derivative here, it's going to be the bottom, x cubed plus one to the seventh, times the derivative of the top. Okay, let's take the derivative of secant of four x. Now I have to use the chain rule because it's the derivative of secant of some stuff. The derivative of secant of x is secant of x times tangent of x. The derivative of secant of some stuff is secant of the stuff times tangent of the stuff times the derivative of the stuff, which is four. All right, the derivative of four x is four. Minus, now we reverse it, right? We do the top times the derivative of the bottom. So it's gonna be secant of four x times the derivative of the bottom. So now I've got some stuff to the seventh power. The derivative of stuff to the seventh power is seven times my stuff which is x cubed plus one to the sixth power times the derivative of that stuff, which is three x squared, all divided by the denominator, which is x cubed plus one to the seventh squared. For the power to a power, you multiply them. So x cubed plus one to the seventh squared is x cubed plus one to the 14th power. You should definitely not simplify this. Do not simplify these gross derivatives unless you are told to, or unless you are trying to like solve it equal to zero. All right, all the chain rule, all the time. Let's do some more. Let's look at, I feel like I had one there that was gonna be there. Sure, we can do, oh yeah, that one looks, I don't think I have enough room for that one. Let's do this one. Let's do that. Let's do the derivative of dbt of what have I got? Let's do, yeah, cotangent of x cubed over x squared plus one. So this one, oh, go ahead. Could you also brought, you totally could. I, I considered that, Madison, that's a good question. So, and th that, I would say this one definitely, that is a more viable option than I normally feel like it is. So you definitely could have written this as the derivative of secant of four X times X cubed plus one to the negative seven power and instead of using the quotient rule with the chain rule inside, you could use the product rule with the chain rule. That would also be fine. Um, I don't, I, yeah, that would also be fine. Like, I don't have a particular preference here either way. Um, yeah. The one thing I'll say why I might do it as the quotient rule versus the product rule like this is that um, if you were trying to simplify this, I feel like it kind of is easier to simplify when you write it this way. I know it might not look like it, but I can factor out 
an x cubed plus one to the sixth, and then x cubed plus one to the sixth, and then cancel the x cubed plus one to the sixth with an x cubed plus one to the 14th, make an x cubed plus one to the eighth denominator. That is something that does happen. And it's, I feel like it's just a little easier to see that when you do it this way versus that way, but not enough that you, you like you, if this is better for you, do it that way. Perfectly good. Okay. So now we're kind of in the reverse situation where we're going to have a chain rule and a quotient rule thing, but the chain rule part is happening first because you've got a function of a quotient where here you had a quotient of different functions, if that makes sense. Oh, and I, and I used, I meant to do this as a function of t, sorry. I wrote d, d, t, and then I wrote cotangent of things with x's. Let me change that. This is cotangent of t cubed over t squared plus one. Sorry about that. So the derivative of cotangent of some stuff, well, the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared of your stuff. So the derivative of cotangent of this is going to be negative cosecant squared of your stuff. And I'm not going to have enough room. Let me write it down here. So it's going to be negative cosecant squared of your stuff, which is t cubed over t squared plus 1, times the derivative of your stuff, which now we're going to use this quotient rule. So it's going to be the bottom times the derivative of the top, which is 3t squared, minus the top, times the derivative of the bottom, which is 2t. I don't need parentheses around any of these since they're each single terms, divided by the denominator squared. And yes, to Madison's question again, could I have rewritten this as t cubed times t squared plus 1 to the negative 1? I totally could have and done it that way. I usually don't opt for that unless it feels like it's making it much simpler. Um, a very, very common example, actually, let me, I'll get that in a second. Um, I also want to point out that you can't put these together because this stuff here is stuck inside the cosecant squared function. And this is just itself on its own, right? It has nothing to do with what's in there. So don't try and multiply those together because you can't. No. Um, what I was going to say is that what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. I know. So here's an example where I would totally, definitely rewrite things. Um, let's see. Let's say I had the derivative of the square root of, sure. x to the fourth plus one divided by sine of x, for example. Especially when your denominator is just a single trig function, bringing it up to the top just means you're going to change it, right? You're not going to, you're not going to bring this up to the top as sine of x to the negative one. I mean, you could, but you're going to bring it up to the top as cosecant of x, because one over sine is the same as cosecant. So we could totally rewrite this as the derivative of the square root x to the fourth plus one times one over sine is the same as the cosecant of x. That's a prime time to prime time. That's a, that's a great time to actually rewrite it so that we don't have to use a quotient rule. And it didn't really get much worse, right? You're not, do, you're not having to be like, okay, it's going to be some weird thing to the negative first power. It's also okay to do that, but I'm just saying we don't, we usually don't. This is gonna be, um, oh, I probably also should have rewritten this as instead of the square root, let's write it as the one half power. I get the derivative of all that stuff to the one half power. So then it's gonna be one half times all the same stuff x to the fourth plus one times cosecant of x, negative one half hour, right? So the derivative of the outside, left the insides alone. And then we're going to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is going to require the product rule. So it's going to be the derivative of the first piece, which is 4x cubed, times the second piece left alone. Right? Remember, with the product rule, it's always the derivative of one thing times the not derivative of the other thing. And then you switch it up. We add 
and then it's going to be x to the fourth plus one times the derivative of cosecant, which is negative cosecant x cotangent x. Um, so that know it's going to be negative. I'm going to put the minus sign right here. That's going to be minus x to the fourth plus one times cosecant x cotangent x. Um, do be careful with the product rule. I saw also a few people in the when they did the product rule in their quiz that they did like that they were doing this. They accidentally did four x cubed plus cosecant plus x to the fourth plus negative cosecant cotangent. Right? It's the it's you're multiplying the derivative and the derivative together and you're adding the minus sign came over the flip reverse way of doing it. Isn't the derivative for sine cosine? The derivative of sine is cosine, but the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant x cotangent, right? So I'm totally correct, Anna. The derivative of sine is definitely cosine, but we rewrote this. We rewrote this as the derivative of the square root of x to the fourth plus one times one over sine of x, and then one over sine of x is equal to cosecant of x. So then it became the derivative of the square root of x to the fourth times cosecant of x. We also could have left it like this and used the quotient rule, but I was just trying to point out that, especially in a case like this, where your denominator is a single trig function, instead of saying you've got stuff divided by the trig function, you can say you've got the same stuff times the reciprocal trig function. Should there be a plus sign in the last part? No, with the so good question, Madison. So there was a plus, so I was saying, right, if I'm taking the derivative of this stuff here, it's four x cubed times cosecant plus x to the fourth plus one times the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant x cotangent x. But then typically what we do when you've got plus something times a negative thing is you, you put the negative sign out in front. So usually we end up writing this as minus like that. Yeah. It's a pretty standard, um, simplification that we just kind of do in the middle of the problem and we don't like write another step for it because we don't want to write it out again. I feel like I haven't drank enough water this morning and like it's hard to say all the words. My mouth is like drink more water, stop talking so much. Started watching a new TV show last night. Uh, Resident Alien, starring Alan Tudyk. He is an alien that is pretending to be a human being on Earth. It was very entertaining. I highly recommend it. Uh, yeah, I, I would say I highly recommend it. It was definitely worth watching. Made me laugh, but also had some seriousness to it. It wasn't just silly. So that's my TV recommendation for the day. Resident Alien. All right, let's do some really, really gross looking ones here. Yeah. Let's okay. This one, this one looks gnarly, but we'll do it. Let's find. So here's our function. Y is. I'm going to change it up just a little bit. Sure. Let's make it cosecant of tangent of x cubed minus. Uh, what do I want to do there? Sure. Let's do sine of x squared. Oh, yeah, that's gross. So gross. Okay. It's especially gross because cosecant makes it so you have to have the thing twice. So we're just going to work our way from the outside in. Cosecant of garbage. The derivative of cosecant of x is negative cosecant of x times cotangent of x. The derivative of cosecant of some garbage is negative cosecant of the garbage times cotangent of the garbage times the derivative of the garbage. Okay. So we're going to get, and this is probably going to take more than one line to write out. Negative cosecant of the garbage times cotangent of the garbage times the derivative of the garbage. So the garbage is tangent of x cubed minus sine of x squared. Also goes there, tangent of x cubed minus sine of x squared. Okay. Now we have to multiply by the derivative of the garbage. So we have to multiply by the derivative of tangent of x cubed minus sine of x squared. I don't want to write out just like 
that thing prime, right? I don't want to write this more than one time. So I'm actually just going to start taking the derivative of tangent of whatever. So what's the derivative of tangent of some stuff? The derivative of tangent of some stuff is secant squared of that stuff times the derivative of the stuff. So we get times, I'm going to write down here because right, we're running out of room. So times secant squared of the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. So the stuff is x cubed minus sine of x squared, and then I have to multiply by the derivative of that stuff. So the derivative of x cubed minus sine of x squared, we have to be a little extra, extra careful here. The derivative of x cubed is straightforward. There is no chain rule to use there. It's just 3x squared. The derivative of sine of x squared, well, the derivative of sine of some stuff is cosine of the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. We have to be careful, right? Because the derivative, right? It's only the 2x multiplying by the derivative of sine of x squared, right? We're not multiplying the 2x times everything. What I'm trying to say in the longest way possible is I've seen a lot of people accidentally say, okay, it's the derivative of this and then times 2x. The 2x doesn't multiply that. The 2x only multiplies the cosine of x squared. So it's minus cosine of x squared times 2x, like that. And that would be the gross derivative of cosecant of tangent of x cubed minus sine of x squared. Just keep throwing the chain rule on it until we're done. Let's see, what else can I, what, else, what other terrible things can I make this do? Hmm. Sure, yeah, let's, okay, yeah, almost awful. So I will, um, in Canvas, I'm gonna post, I, I might have already, the same that might already be in Canvas, but if it's not, I'll post it. It's a, it's a worksheet with product quotient and chain rule questions. There's like 27 questions on it. If you're looking for more practice, I think it is good practice. Also, I have answers to it, which I will also post so you can check your work. Um, but yeah, if you're looking for, if you're looking for more product quotient chain rule problems to do, this will be a great place for you to find them. So I will get that posted in Canvas if it's not already there. Um, let's look at, sure, I will also send it as an announcement. Um, I will announce that I have posted it, yes. Uh, sorry, I was looking for the next problem. Let's, let's see which one of those is more awful. Let's do this one. Let's find the derivative of the fifth root of, yeah, sure. Cosine of x to the fourth times sine of x over x cubed minus one. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Okay, um, the only thing I would do before actually differentiating this is I would definitely rewrite any root as a power. So instead of writing it as the fifth root, let's write it as all that stuff to be one fifth power. Okay, so now the derivative of some stuff to the one fifth power is going to be one fifth times our stuff. To the one fifth minus one is one fifth minus five fifth, which is negative four fifths power times the derivative of this stuff. Okay. The derivative of cosine of some new stuff is negative sine of the new stuff times the derivative of the new stuff. That's going to be times negative sine of the new stuff, x to the fourth times sine of x over x cubed minus one times the derivative of that new stuff. The derivative of this new stuff won't require the product rule, or sorry, it won't require the chain rule, but it will require the quotient and the product rule. So yeah, I'll write it down here, times, All right, the derivative of this stuff is gonna be bottom,
times the derivative of the top. Okay, the derivative of the top does require the product rule. So it's x to the fourth times sine of x. So it's going to be 4x cubed times sine of x plus x to the fourth times the derivative of sine is cosine of x. Oof, okay, so there's the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top x to the fourth sine of x times the derivative of the bottom, which is 3x squared minus 0, all divided by the denominator squared. And that is our final answer. I would definitely, definitely, definitely not simplify any of this. It is hot trash. Um, the only thing I might do, I might put this minus sign out in front, but even that is like, you know. Um, I suppose we could do that, right? We could do it. But see, so here's the, here's the thing. The, one of the reasons I would actually encourage you to leave it exactly like this is because the person grading your work can see that you really did use the chain rule, right? You said, okay, there's one fifth times my stuff to the negative four fifths, and then I multiply by the derivative of cosine of whatever, and I got negative sign of whatever. And not that they can't see if you put the negative sign out in front, but it just makes them have to look a little bit harder for your correctly done derivative. So I really, when it's a giant chain rule gross problem like this, I really encourage you to leave things in kind of this order if they have said to not simplify it. Simplifying this is, is unreasonable in any case, but yeah. Okay. Let's, yeah, let's do one of these. Oh yeah, we definitely, I definitely, yeah, okay. Here's a good problem, and I'm gonna take this one directly from the handout. Let's find where, yeah, yeah, this kind of question is always, where does this function, I should get, I should do up on this code. Where does f of x equal to, there was a question like this on the quiz, Where's f of x equal to x minus one to the fourth times two x minus three to the fifth have horizontal tangents. This is an example of a, you have to take the derivative and then you do have to simplify it. Because if you're trying to set a function or an equation equal to zero, you have to simplify it to be able to solve it. So we're going to use the product rule. So f prime of x. The derivative of x minus 1 to the fourth is 4 times x minus 1 to the third times the derivative of the stuff, but the derivative of the stuff is just 1. You could write times 1 if you really want. So derivative of this times the not derivative of this plus, then we do it the other way, right? We do the not derivative of this times the derivative of this. The derivative of two x minus three to the fifth, or some stuff to the fifth, is five times your stuff to the fourth times the derivative of your stuff, which is two. And we're setting that equal to zero. And I think it's pretty safe to say that there are two obvious answers. X equal to one, right? If you plug in one for x, that's zero, which means this whole part's zero. And that's zero, this whole part's zero. So one's an obvious answer, and so is positive three halves. If you plug in three halves, you get zero here, zero times whatever is zero, you get zero here. But there is a third answer, and you can only find that answer if you factor out. So what can I factor out from both of these? Well, I can factor out an x minus one cubed. I can also factor out a 2x minus 3 to the fourth. You can always factor out the smaller power of a common factor. I could also probably factor out a 2 or something. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to just leave it in. So I factored out those things and let's see what am I left with. Well, here I'm left with a 4. I don't have any x minus 1s left because I factored all of them out. But I am left with a 2x minus 3 because I factored out four of them and there were five of them. Plus, over here, I factored out x minus 1 cubed, but there were four of them here, so I have an x minus 1 left over. I also have a 5. 
I don't have any 2x minus 3, so they factored all four of them out. And then you also have the 2. So now, simplifying this inside part, I have x minus 1 cubed, 2x minus 3 to the fourth, times the just 3 to the 4, I get 8x minus 12. Distribute the 10, and I get 10x minus 10. And simplifying that even further, I've got x minus 1 cubed times 2x minus 3 to the fourth times 8x plus 10x is 18x minus 12 minus 10 is minus 22. So my three solutions are set x minus 1 equal to 0, get x equal to 1. Set 2x minus 3 equal to 0, you get 2x equal to 3, so x equal to 3 halves. And finally, set 18x minus 22 equal to 0. You get 18x equal to 22, or x equal to 22 over 18, which reduces to 11 over 9. Oh, that's gross. The pen just picked up like a big old chunk of pen flake that's on the board. Really doesn't fit. Okay. So that's how you solve a problem like this. Um, typically, so if you see this kind of setup where you've got a product of two things raised to different powers or the same, this is not a the same or different, but they're both positive powers and they ask you to find where the horizontal tangents are, there's always gonna be two obvious answers, the ones that make each of these things zero and then one third, a third not obvious answer that you can only find by factoring like this. See what else have I got? Mm, let's do it. Yeah, let's do one of those. More chain rule. Chain rule all the time. Chain rule all the time. All the time. It's the chain rule. I mean, so I know I'm just singing a dumb song. I was just making up there, but literally, like the chain rule really is kind of always in play. You should always be thinking when you see a function and you're going to take its derivative. Do I need to use a chain rule? Is there some inner function whose derivative also needs to be considered? Um, let's look at something like, let's look at just an easy one for a second. Let's say I want to find the derivative of cosecant of x squared plus 9. This one is not terrible, relatively speaking. So remember, so we have to remember the derivative of the trig functions, right? They're kind of just, we need to memorize them. You need to memorize them. Um, the derivative of cosecant of x is negative cosecant of x times cotangent of x. So the derivative of cosecant of some stuff is going to be negative cosecant of your stuff times cotangent of your stuff times the derivative of your stuff. Where the stuff here is x squared plus 9, the stuff here is x squared plus 9, and the derivative of the stuff is 2x. So that's your stuff. That's your stuff. And I'll remind you all that specifically secant and cosecant are kind of weird when you're doing the chain rule. Secant and cosecant are the only functions we encounter where you take the derivative of cosecant of some stuff, you get the stuff popping up twice before you multiply it by the derivative of the stuff. Same is true for secant. Those are both, they're kind of strange. No other function really has that happen. Right? Like if I said, you know, what's the derivative of, I don't know, uh, sure, tangent of x to the fourth plus sine of x plus eight. The derivative of tangent of some stuff is just secant squared of the stuff times the derivative of the stuff, right? The stuff only occurs one time, which is, What's happening almost every time you use a chain rule, except for this kind of weirdness. So the derivative of tangent of some stuff is secant squared of that stuff, right? We leave the stuff alone, and then we multiply by the derivative of the stuff. So leaving the stuff alone, it just gets left alone. And then we multiply by the derivative of all this, which is 4x cubed plus cosine x. Do be really careful here. I've definitely seen people write that the answer was something like secant squared of 
four x cubed plus cosine of x. Right, where they wanted to take the derivative of the stuff too soon. Right, whenever you're using the chain rule, the inside thing stuff, whatever you want to call it, the inside stuff should always actually show up again as it looked originally. And then also it's derivative if you show up. Okay. Um, yeah. I can do a million examples. The other things you guys want to see in these last six minutes, welcome to let me know. Otherwise, it's jingle all the time, jingle all the time. There's some song in my head that I think it's like party all the time, party all the time. Right? There's something that's, that's definitely in there. This is what I'm actually thinking of when I'm saying it's jingle all the time. Sure. Let's make it super duper freaking awful. <laughs> let's find the derivative of, let's not make it as awful as possible though. Let's do sine to the sixth power of, yeah. oh yeah, I'm gonna make this gross, of tangent squared of x to the, why always four? Why always four, James? Let's pick a different number. You can pick other powers. So let's do the square root of x plus, 9x squared. Okay, this looks really, really terrible. I actually really, I have to rewrite it here so I know what's what. This is the derivative of sine of all this stuff to the sixth power. And then the stuff here, so tangent squared of all this stuff is tangent of that stuff squared. And this is going to be gross. And then we should write square root of x is x to the one half. All right. So, derivative of sine of, derivative of something to the sixth power is six times your something to the fifth power. So I've got my something here is just sine of tangent of x to the one half plus nine x squared squared. Okay. Times the derivative of the inside. Okay, the inside is sine of a new function your sine of a new function is cosine of a new function. It's cosine of all this garbage, which is tangent of x to the one half plus nine x squared squared times the derivative of the inside. Okay, the inside, the inside is some stuff squared. So it's gonna be two times your stuff which is tangent of x to the one half plus nine x squared to the first. I wouldn't normally write to the first, but you can. Times, okay, so I did, right, I did the derivative of some stuff squared. I got two times my stuff times the derivative of the stuff. The derivative of tangent is secant squared of the function. So the, of, so the derivative of tangent of some stuff is secant squared of the stuff, which multiplied by the derivative of that stuff. And the derivative of this stuff is, well, the derivative of x to the one half is one half x to the minus one half. The derivative of nine x squared is 18x. That's probably a bit extreme. 